Good morning and welcome to Ellerslie Church Online. My name is Mel and I'm grateful for the privilege of being the pastoral point leader at Ellerslie. Our worship this morning will be bracketed by two ceremonies of remembrance. At the end of our time together, we'll share in the ceremony that we call communion, which Jesus instituted to help us remind ourselves that His death and His resurrection are the foundation and center of our story. If you need to press pause for a few minutes to get some bread and a cup of juice ready for that, why don't you do that right now? Well, we'll start our time today at the beginning of this week in which we have Remembrance Day by remembering other deaths, those who died in service to our country, to allow us to live in a land of at least relative security and safety and privilege. So if it's doable for you, we invite you to stand in a posture of respect and reflect in silence as our national anthem is played, and then spend a few minutes in silence before we pray. Let's pray together. O Lord, our God, we pause to recognize that the road on which we walk was not built by us and not paved by us, but by the sacrifice of many who fought for our freedom and many who continue to protect and preserve our security. Father, for those who have died, we thank you and ask that you help us to live more humbly knowing that we are walking and building on the work and sacrifice of others. For those who are still working in protective and emergency services to keep us safe and secure, I pray that you will protect them and keep their minds alert, their spirits sensitive, and their hearts warm. And thank you that because of the sacrifice of others, we have the freedom to proclaim and to grow in and to grow on the greatest sacrifice of Jesus who died to make us his. As we worship today, help us to see again how secure, how safe, how free, how rich we are in you because of Jesus. Lord, we remember. Amen. Feel free to sit down or whatever posture is best for you to join in worship with us together. Thank you for joining with us here at Ellerslie for our online tradition service. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, as we gather before you this day, I 
pray that our hearts will be in tune with that which you desire for us and that your Holy Spirit would have his way within our hearts as we sing these songs, as we offer ourselves to you in worship this day. Be glorified in our midst, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us as we sing, May the mind of Christ my Savior live in us from day to day. <clears throat> May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. By his love and power controlling all I do and say. May the word of God dwell richly in my heart from hour to hour. So that all may see I triumph only through his power. May the peace of God my Father rule my life in everything that I may be calm to comfort sick and sorrowing. fill me as the waters fill the sea. Him exalting self abasing, this is victory. May I run the race before me, strong and brave to face the foe, looking only Our call to worship today is from Psalm 78, verses 1 to 7. O my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they, in turn, would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Let's make this request of the Lord this morning as we sing, Open my eyes that I may see. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me place in my hands a wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free silently now I wait for thee ready my God thy will to see open my eyes of truth thou sendest clear and while the wave notes fall on my ear everything false will disappear silently now I wait for thee ready my God thy will to see open my ears
What shall I fear while yet thou dost lead? Only for light from thee I plead. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my mind, illumine me. Speak. Today we close with the chorus, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonder. Hey Ellersley family, a great opportunity we have to serve our world this season is through Operation Christmas Child. Let's hear more about it through this video. At the count of three, when children open the shoe boxes, they're so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited, giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. If you would like to pack a shoebox in partnership with Samaritan's Purse, you'll be able to pick up shoeboxes at the church during our on-site service or from a bin outside the church doors throughout the week. You can pack it full of toys, gifts, and hygiene items, and it will be sent to a child in need. And along with that gift, the gospel we shared through the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program. We only have two weeks left until Collection Week, so make sure you pick up your shoeboxes today if you're on site, or stop by the church this week and grab them from the Dropbox outside. To get the most up-to-date information on Operation Christmas Child and what we're doing here at Ellerslie, you can head on over to erbc.ca slash shoebox. A question I'm often asked is, how do I get involved at Ellerslie? And this can be a really tricky question to navigate, especially during our COVID season where we're doing church in so many different ways and through different platforms. The best way to get more information on what's happening here at Ellerslie, to connect to a pastor, to join a small group, or to get involved in serving is by filling out a connect card. And you can do that by heading on over to erbc.ca connect. 
Your faithful giving allows us to continue producing our services, devotional videos to support our local care team and our global missions partners all around the world. There are a variety of ways that you can continue to support Ellerslie, including by mail, setting up pre-authorized giving, and giving online. For more information on these options and to give online, head on over to erbc.ca slash give. Now, grab your pen, a notebook, and a Bible, and let's dive into this week's message from our series, Leading Me. As we begin this morning, I'd like you to think back to the most difficult leadership assignment or task you have ever taken on. Every one of us has had some experience of being asked to step forward and take the lead in some way. What was your most difficult assignment? I'm never doing that again. Remember the first time your mother said to you, I'm going up for 30 minutes. I'd like you to look after your younger sister for that time. It's like, okay, I'm somebody born for this. Within three minutes of mom leaving the door, you said, I don't want this, right? Remember that? You may not remember it, but your mother does. Because for her, that was a leadership assignment over you. And it frustrated her. What about project-based learning team at school and you had to take your turn leading the team? Very quickly, it's like, oh, I'd just rather do this myself, right? I asked LaDonna this week about her first worst leadership assignment she remembered. I mean, it wasn't two seconds, and she said, P.E., phys ed class. I knew she had a lot of, tr- a lot of trauma associated with phys ed, but leadership? And as calm and caring and most appreciative inquiry kind of voice, I said, you, a leader in PE? How did that happen? She said, being asked to be the captain of the team. I had to take my turn. I hated it. How about the first opportunity as a shift manager at work? You knew you had some ideas for making things work better, but when you stepped up, you saw barriers you never thought about, calls you had to make that, that just didn't, you didn't want to make. You were critical of the person before you, and now suddenly it's you, Right? I don't know what came to your mind, but I do know your most, di- leadership difficult ass- your most difficult leadership assignment. I know it because it's yours, it's mine, it's all of ours. The most difficult person to lead is me. I can handle anything and anyone better if I can lead me well. That's what we're talking about over the next few weeks, last couple of weeks until the end of November. This week I tested that, this statement off several people who are skilled and successful leaders and whom I respect as mature and wise people. I just tested off them. The most difficult person to lead is me. And the response I got was, well, here are three direct quotes that I remember. Isn't that the truth? Wow, you certainly got that right. Oh my goodness, that's certainly true for me. These are mature, wise, godly, good people. Last week, we were introduced to the place to start if I truly want to lead me well. Here's a foundational truth that I hope has hit home for you in the next while. It's actually a freeing truth. Leading me is not about me leading me. Leading me well is not about me leading me. If we think leading me is about leading me, we set ourselves up, or about me leading me, we set ourselves up for frustration, for failure, and for a lot of faking it. Why? Because as soon as I begin to think it's about me leading me, I'm going to run into conflict with God, who is trying to lead me. The God who, as Paul says, has begun something in us and is Working to complete that in us. Our leading me failures begin when we, when we become in tension, in conflict with how and where God is trying to lead us. And how, God, how does God do this? Last week we saw. He does it like a shepherd who cares for us, who protects us, who provides for us, and who honors and validates us in the very presence of everyone and everything that puts us down and pulls us down. Psalm 23. Have you come to to know the shepherd? Have you come to believe 
that he is shepherding you. Leading me is not about me leading me. It's about letting God, who made me for a purpose, who knows me like no other, who has a plan for me that is best, let him lead me like a shepherd. Now, we intuitively know that. And at certain times, we, we want the assurance and the, and the comfort of that, at least as an idea. We may not submit to it, but we want the assurance of it as an idea. I know that because Psalm 23 is the one passage from God's Word that I get asked to read when I lead a family in a funeral more than any other passage, even by people who claim to have you no use for faith. I'll ask them, is there, is there any kind of passage from God's Word that you know that you would like me to read at the funeral. Oh yeah, the shepherd psalm, right? Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need for every situation I will encounter. He leads me. Every time I read that at a funeral, I marvel at the fact that although we like that as a comforting idea, that we have a shepherd leader, I, I, I just, I ask myself, how many of us really live into that idea of of surrendered, submitted oneness with the God of the universe who became one of us to lead us home, to lead us like a shepherd, as sheep the tender to tend to wander off on our own way. Shepherd leadership is not just about how he leads us, but also about where he is leading us. Ultimately, home, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, is how the psalm ends. But where is he leading today? Well, in Psalm 23, we saw it last week, it's in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How many of us prayed that prayer every day this week? Lord, lead me today in your path, not my path, in your path, the path of your righteousness for your sake, not my sake. Help me to see it sooner. Help me to do it better today. Empower me to do it well. And when I blow it, help me to recognize it sooner and admit it to someone else. What? Admit it to someone else? Really? Some of us were tracking until that last phrase. Right? Admit it to someone else? Do I really need to do that? Hold that question for two minutes. We need to pause right here and acknowledge that today is what is sometimes called in the history of the church today, Reformation Sunday. Reformation Sunday. For those of you who know the history of the church, you'll know that what is called the, the Reformation period of church history began in the early 1500s, along with all kinds of revolutionary new kinds of things that were happening in those days, the scientific revolution leading into the Enlightenment. If you know history, you'll know that, that all of these things were, were spurred on by one key factor, the printing press. Probably the single most significant invention since the wheel. The printing press was the machine that made mass production of books possible and was foundational in the starting of, university, of the whole university movement, which led to the period of enlightenment and scientific revolution. And people began studying the classics, most notably the Bible. Priests became educated for the first time and began to read and study the Bible for themselves. One of those priests was Martin Luther, a man who... If you know his story, he had his own struggles in the, in the leading me business. But he began soaking himself in the Bible, especially the book of Romans, which led in 1517 to Luther stepping up. And although some have over-dramatized it and say he nailed a thesis to the door of the church in Winnipeg, probably a, a well-meaning myth, but he did mail a long, long letter to the archbishop to say, well, summarizing it up was this, hey, bro. We need to address some of the practices the church has condoned, especially manipulating poor people out of their money by saying they can buy their dead relatives out of purgatory, fleecing the sheep, not leading the sheep, money which was used to build these majestic, uh, uh, very uh, uh, ornate, expensive cathedrals so that the prince and the bishop would look good compared to other places. Luther was not trying, 
basically, he says, it's not in the book. It actually violates what's in the book. Luther wasn't trying to split off from the church. He was trying to get on the table a discussion about the, how the church was actually abusing the, the shepherd leadership of Jesus. So here's this dedicated priest in the system wanting to get it right. He's devouring God's word, and, and he comes to the New Testament letter by the apostle James. And in chapter 5, verse 16, there was a statement that hit him. Therefore, now we're back on track here. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that may, you may be healed. Confess your sins to whom? A priest? No, to each other. He looked at that and... and as I was taught in my church history course, he looked at that in the margin of his Bible. He wrote by that verse, strange confessor this, his name is one another. When we fail in the task of leading ourselves by taking our path and not God's path of righteousness, he calls us to admit it to someone else, not just to God, to one another. Why to one another? Because the primary way God shepherds us through life is through other people. God's plan A for shepherding me is other people. Can you identify shepherding relationships that you have had with other people that actually moved you forward in God's path? Leading me well requires letting others into my life to shepherd me under God. One of the reasons that we're, we're trying to help you establish triads to help each other do that. In the New Testament, there are at least 32 references to, to one another kind of relationships that we are to offer others and to allow others to have in our life. Build one another up. Confess your sins to one another. Instruct one another. Have mutual concern for one another. Serve one another in love. Carry one another's burdens. On and on. All of those are the working out of the foundational truth that God's plan A for shepherding me, for leading me in his paths of righteousness is other people. Meaningful connection with other people in the body. There's this very interesting summary of that process in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. From him... From Jesus, the head of the body, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, connective tissue, connecting each other. Who are the supporting ligaments? You and I. People. From him, the whole body grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. What is the work each part of the body is supposed to do? You know, we camp on this idea of, well, i got to be able to use my spiritual gift. Well, perhaps that's part of it, but that's not the point of it. It's to build each other up in any way that I can Shepherding each other in paths of righteousness. Yes, we grow on Jesus, we grow in Jesus, but it's through people that God causes this growth in our life. As each part does its work in the connecting tissue way. Commenting on this statement and, and a struggle that, that this person had uh, in his own life. He said this, God does not delegate the process of developing me to people. God wears people as his uniform as we respond to the shepherding influence of others in our lives we are actually allowing God Jesus to shepherd us into his paths of righteousness there's a phrase in the Old Testament in a book that's part of what what is called wisdom literature that makes this point in a in sort of a, a, a reflective principle kind of way it's actually the foundation I think, for the, for the one another commands in the New Testament. We're going to spend the rest of our time this morning reflecting 
on this phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 in the Old Testament. Get your Bible or your Bible app and open that up right now. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. There's this penny-dropping insight by a, a disillusioned and cynical man, probably King Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, the central statement in this chapter, two are better than one. Do you believe that? When it comes to leading me, it's never the goal to have me leading me. And it's never only about me allowing the shepherd, Jesus, to lead me in some kind of a mystical way. It's always better to see who the shepherd is allowing into my life to affirm me, confront me, perhaps to refine how I'm thinking, or to team up with me in what I think, how I can make it a reality. Two are better than one. People see things in me, about me, that I don't see. Some, are, some of them are strengths. Some of them are very undeveloped strengths. Some of them are weaknesses. They see things about how I am seeing things, and they might offer me a different perspective. He goes on to describe almost poetically the, the obvious, the, well, what we might say the, like, duh, benefits of two being one, or of two being better than one. Two are better than one because mutual effort produces better results. They have a good return for their labor. Two are better than one because mutual support keeps you going on the journey. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Two are better than one because mutual encouragement keeps you warm and vibrant. Also, he says, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can anyone keep warm alone? An alone person becomes a cold person. Two are better than one. Because mutual strength brings greater security. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Actually, it's more than just two. It's, it's three. It's even better. We need to see how Solomon comes to this point of seeing this dream, this ideal. Solomon was a man who inherited what he got from his father, King David. He even inherited his position as king. By all appearances, Solomon was strong enough, smart enough, and wealthy enough to be totally independent from anybody else for everything. He did not need people. But at some point, life for him became, well, meaningless, as the book of Ecclesiastes continually says, worthless. And he finally decides to use the wisdom God had given him to do some personal reflection to look at the bigger picture outside of himself. That's the book of Ecclesiastes, an internal philosophical dialogue in the mind of a man who has become cynical about life. And he comes to this two are better than one insight by seeing and acknowledging what is really going on around him and with people over whom he has been called to be the shepherd leader. In this section, leading up to this two are better than one insight, the first eight verses of chapter four, he observes three different scenarios, three scenarios that have one common thread, three scenarios that on the one hand make him disillusioned and confirms his cynicism about life, but that ultimately lead him to the only insight that counts, that two are better than one. As we read these three scenarios. You're going to read verses 1 to 8. As we read them, follow along in your own Bible and see if you can pick out the common thread that runs through these scenarios. Scenario 1, what we call the oppression of inequity or injustice. 
Again, I looked, he says, and saw the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead who had already died are happier than the living who are still alive, but better than both of them is the one who's never been born, who has not seen the evil that's done under the sun. There's a cynicism. Scenario two, the competitive envy of most of our work situations. Not just our paid work, but everything we go do in life. I saw, verse four, that all toil and all achievement springs from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Fools hold their hands and ruin themselves. Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Again, scenario three. He talks about the isolation of individualism. I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. Why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Has life changed much in three centuries? Isolation, which leads to injustice, competition, oppression, or uh, individualism, sorry. Did you catch the common thread that runs through all three? Each of them is rooted in disconnection. The results in life of not living in a two are better than one way. Some because of the choices of others who have resources to make it all about themselves. Some because of their own choices in making it all about themselves. The results of I got to put me first, do it for myself kind of living is always disconnection. Let's go through them a little more carefully. Look at the, the progression, actually, between them. Peeling back the layers from the outward to the inward. Inequality. I saw the tears of the oppressed. Power was on the side of the oppressor. And, and what does he see? Twice he says it. They have no comforter. Now, that word comforter means many things, including advocate, defender, but above all, it's a, it's a relational kind of word. A strengthening, personal connectioning per kind of word. When the Old Testament, which was originally written in Hebrew, when it was translated into the Greek language, which was the trade language of the first century, the first few centuries after Jesus, the, the Greek word that was used to translate this word comforter was a word called parakletos or per, from the verb parakaleo. If you've read the New Testament and studied it a bit, that word might just ring a bell for you. It's the word Jesus uses in John chapter 14 when he promised the Holy Spirit that he would send when he left to be our parakletos, our comforter, our literally our one who is called alongside to be with us, part of the Godhead. But here in Ecclesiastes, he says, we need to be that for each other. A core factor in, in, in what we call injustice is simply disconnection. As I read what, Solomon, read what Solomon says about the problem behind inequality and injustice, I asked myself two questions. What would happen if every person who rants against systemic evil would own that we, we are all the system. The connective tissue. And would see that the place to begin is not ranting against the system. It's a personal relationship with someone who's a victim of the system. As Brian Stevenson, you might know his name from the movie Just Mercy. If you haven't seen it, watch it. 
a lawyer who's making a difference in the system, says the one thing we can all do is, I love it, get proximate. There's power, he says, in proximity. That's what Solomon is saying here, Ecclesiastes 4, in a negative kind of way. No matter how powerless you think you are, you have the power to come alongside someone, to listen to them, to bring them in your circle. You see, rather than focus on myself and who I'm not connected with, perhaps we need to begin by focusing on someone who might simply value a connection with me. Second question I asked myself, would what, what would happen if every person who ranted about white privilege on social media, who made that cathartic, oh, I admit I come from white privilege confession, what would happen if everyone who did that came alongside one person to listen to them, to relate to them, to give them some time? Would that be the beginning of systemic change? We can do that. Disconnection, next, I think the order, the way Paul puts it, is that disconnection is rooted in envy. Envy, competitive comparing. I saw that all toil, all achievements spring from one person's envy of another. Much more of our effort, our mental energy that we want to admit is spent on comparing ourselves with and competing with self with those that we think have some advantage over us. Envy and jealousy of what someone else has. Comparing and then competing. Okay, I won't go on a social media rant here, but I don't have to. Right? And as Solomon finishes his reflective tour of his environment, his kingdom, many commentators think that he suddenly wakes up to what his own life has been. The isolation of individualism because the goal of individualism is self-sufficiency. I don't need anybody else. I don't want to need anyone else. And when you get there, it's a very, very lonely existence. Again, I saw, verse 7, saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone, himself. He had neither son nor brother, alienated from everybody. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling? Solomon seems to realize this is me. I'm the problem, not as a king, but as a person. Ever since the original, you know better than God what's best for you lie that humanity got sucked into, we have this bent towards I know what's best for me thinking and what's best for me becomes the center of my thinking, me first. And if we believe that we know what's best for me, we have to portray in our own minds at least that we were the ones who have made our own decisions, have built our own lives. One of the great screen heroes, heroes of our time died yesterday. Sean Connery, the original James Bond, a man who in his personal life fought his way up from the bottom, from poverty and the slums of Edinburgh. He quit school at 13 to go to work in the shipyards and brick factories of Edinburgh. He was a hard worker and a tough guy. He was <laughs> James Bond. One day he was walking alone on the streets of the rougher part of Edinburgh and he was jumped by six gang members. He stopped them from stealing from him, but as he kept going, they followed him. He turned around and launched a one-man assault on six men, according to his BBC obituary, which I read yesterday. He won hands down. After he became famous as an actor with a reputation for being a bit of a loner, with a quite short fuse, he responded to a question about that with this statement. My view, he said, is that to get anywhere in life, you have to be antisocial. Otherwise, you'll end up being devoured. Isn't that us? 
Isn't that why guys like that are our heroes? And yet as we read the story of Connery's career, you realize that, that he had many people in his life who, who opened doors for him, who broke down barriers for him, who paved the way for him by promoting him to the right people in the right circles in which he was not connected. It's never, I did it by myself. For some of us, if we're honest as we think about leading me, our goal is to become strong enough, smart enough, and wealthy enough to be totally independent from anybody else for everything. Because other people hurt us. Other people limit us. Other people disappoint us. Other people cost us. Other people hold us back. Free to be me means being accountable to no one but myself, responsible for nobody but myself, dependent on nobody but myself. That's our picture. That's the real picture in our minds of someone who has mastered self-leadership. And that, folks, is our problem. It's a key thing that keeps us from cooperating with the God who's leading us. And his plan A is other people. We even have a religious, a, a very spiritual, sound, spiritual sounding version of that, which I encountered when I was trying to come to terms with this truth of God's plan A for shepherding me as other people. I had become to believe in the, the one another's of the New Testament. I had done my time during graduate school as an intern in a church in which the New Testament one another's were the foundation of the church's ministry. I had completed my training in graduate school focusing on the study of the New Testament, especially the letters of Paul. I was powerfully impacted by understanding from the book of Ephesians chapter 4 how God works to build his church his, through people being the connective tissue and building his body. And then at 29 years old, I was unleashed to take on the pastoral role in a church in a city close to where I grew up. I humbled myself and I invited someone I deeply respected as a leader growing up into my, well, we might say our leading me circle. I realized that if I was to succeed, I still needed to grow in Jesus, in character, which meant allowing people in my life to shepherd me. And I went to this man and I said, you know, I believe that you probably know me better than I know myself in some ways, in more ways than I might realize. Could I meet with you once a month and just invite you to see what you observe in me? And I want to be open to your perspective on that and how I could grow in Christ-like character. The man looked at me and he said, I know that's in right now, but I don't believe in it. All you need to do is find out what God's calling you to do and just do it. Don't let other people get in the way of that. As I came to get to know this man as an adult, one of his own life challenges, stumbling blocks, was stubborn independence. I believed this man was wrong, but it took the wind out of my sails. I didn't give up. And within a year, I came across a book that shaped my Two are better than one leading me journey. It was a book by Gordon MacDonald called Restoring Your Spiritual Passion. He describes the kinds of things that threaten our spiritual passion, a lot of which are people. But he wraps it up with the kinds of relationships that restore our spiritual passion and are, well, as I see it now, are the shepherds that God brings to us that we need to see his gifts to help us lead ourselves well in a two or better than one kind of way. Six kinds of relationships, people to look for in the body of Christ to build us up in this journey. Now, as we make this list, it'll be easy to say, well, nobody's doing that for me. Can I suggest that if it's true that God has begun a good work in you and will continue it, and if it's true that his plan A is other people, there's a greater likelihood that the problem is that I'm not seeing those God might be bringing into my life who are willing to do it and sometimes even trying to do it. But they're just not good enough for us. They're not the right people. As we look at these, ask God to open your eyes to see who's bringing alongside of you as a two are better than one gift. Okay? Number one, 
everyone needs a sponsor. A person, usually, usually inside the system, but not necessarily, who, who opens the door, who removes a barrier, who promotes us to others. A number of, a number of years ago, I read an article in Forbes written by a woman who had broken the glass ceiling and had become a CEO in a successful corporation. One of the things she said, never forget it. She said, forget a mentor. Find a sponsor. Everyone looks for mentors, and, and, and that's fine. But, but what we often need more is a sponsor. When I read that, I looked back on my life and realized again that everything God has allowed me to do was not because I was so special or anything significant or had special gifts. It was much more a result of people who had sponsored me, who had opened doors, who had paved the way. And I sent off a number of emails and made a few phone calls thanking people for a sponsorship that they had given me in my life. Can you think of a sponsor relationship in the Bible? Probably the most famous one in the New Testament one is in Acts chapter 9. Paul, a murderer of followers of Jesus, becomes a follower of Jesus and is appointed by Jesus to lead, lead his church. He starts out in the northern community of Damascus, and, but eventually he ends up down in Jerusalem and he tries to join Jesus' core followers in a meeting. And they're saying, are you kidding? He's probably here to spy on us and arrest us. In steps Barnabas. Not one of the core, but a significant leader in his own right. And tells them Paul's story. And he opens the door for Paul in Jerusalem. And the rest is history. Oh yes, God called Paul. Jesus met Paul. And equipped Paul in the desert by himself. But he used Barnabas to open the door for Paul into what he had called him to do, a sponsor. But we need more than sponsors. And sponsors often show up and are willing to open doors because we have been open to other shepherd leaders in our lives. One of them is the affirmer. affirmer an affirmer takes up where a sponsor leads off. She's the one who, who senses our discouragement when we think we blew it and says one affirming word. Now, affirmation is different than an empty compliment or a compliment with a hook. You know all about those. For me, I think of a man when I was 19 years old by the name of Henry Budd, Dr. Henry Budd. After my first public talk in college, which was all of six minutes, thinking I blew it in front of all my peers and was an absolute failure. Walking down the aisle after chapel, convinced this was confirmation that I could now go on with the rest of my life without any sense that God might be calling me into ministry. I was relieved, actually. I hit the back of the aisle, walked into the foyer, and there was Dr. Budd standing and waiting for me. Dr. Budd never stood, and Dr. Budd never waited. He was always moving. And here he was, waiting for me. And he simply said one thing, Mel... I think you need to consider coming back next year. I've always believed we needed to send our best and brightest into church leadership. I hope you're coming back. The affirmer. But we also need rebukers. Those willing to tell the truth in love. So many people are willing to speak behind our backs. Rebukers are willing to gently, positively, say something to make you better. And we continue to need it. I, I think of a person who was part of the old guard in the church in which we spent most of our ministry years. She was certainly a truth teller, somewhat blunt. But over the years, she had proven that she was for me. Defending me, supporting me even if she disagreed with me, affirming me. After one service many years ago... She came up to me and she says, Mel, there's a lot of powerful truth in what you say, but it would be even more powerful if you change just one word. Okay, I'm listening. I can do that. She went on. Quite often, you say, you. You do this, you don't do that. Or you should do this. If you would simply use the word we more often, we do this, don't we? Why don't we do that? It would sound more like you're not preaching at us, but you're walking with us. 
looks powerful. Are you listening to the rebukers in your life? By the way, criticism is not rebuke. It's sometimes portrayed as rebuke. But criticism, regardless of what is said, is aimed to cut you down to size. It's not aimed to build you up. We also need intercessors. Those who accept the role of holding us up before God regularly in prayer. As a young youth pastor, I was asked by the pastor to visit a a very elderly couple in our church who just lived a few blocks from me. I never did ask him, but I wondered years later if he did it more for me than for them. Because out of that visit, Mrs. Frid, blind Mrs. Frid, prayed for me every single day until she died quite a few years later. About the time Mrs. Frid died, God brought another man into my life, a man that I had brought in from Toronto to speak at a Christmas outreach banquet. When I dropped him off at the airport the next day, he said to me, Mel, since I have become a follower of Jesus and now a speaker on the Christian circuit, I have come to appreciate the difficult challenge of being a pastor, and I have a list of pastors I pray for every single Sunday morning. And I want you to know that this morning, I put you on that list. And I believe that to this day, Paul Henderson is still praying for me. By the way, maybe this is the shepherding role that God is inviting you to have on his team to be part of that connective tissue building the body up. Who are you praying for regularly? And number five, we need partners, special friends who don't criticize us for our areas of ungiftedness, who don't undermine us because of our weakness, but who pick up for us, who offer to take over in areas in which we are not strong. Gordon MacDonald in his book said, partners pick up a part of the load and accept responsibility for it. Nothing is too menial or too outrageous if partners believe in one another. The problem with a lot of people who say they want to be partners is that they're actually secretly competitors, right? I can do this better than you, and I'm going to show it. You get the distinct impression they want to partner with you not to maximize your capacity, but to validate their capacity. That's not a partner. That's a competitor. They want to use you, not serve with you, and serve, and serve you. As many of you know, Pastor Dave has been an unbelievable partner for me, not competing with me, but partnering with me, offering his strength in a servant kind of way to make me better. Partners. And finally, everyone needs a pastor. I'm not talking about a paid pastor or somebody with a position, but a tender-hearted, insightful person who sees our exhaustion our weariness, our frustration, our confusion, who does not judge us and lecture us, but comes alongside and helps us make sense of it, helps us see it in a new light, helps us to believe things are doable and whose presence is just, just, just strengthening. A pastor is often a generalist, a utility infielder, we might call him in baseball. Folks, this is often, and and I believe most often, the role God wants us to play in our marriages. Partner? Certainly in my life, the one who pastors me best and most is my wife. Are you being that in your marriage? Or have you succumbed to the individualistic, I'm not getting anything out of this anymore, lie. Partners. To be the connective tissue. To build up your own circles. Now, do we always have all of these people in our lives? No. But if leading me well is our goal, these are the kinds of shepherds God will send along. Are you looking for them? Are you seeing them? Two questions as we close. Number one, who is God calling me to be a connective tissue for them in some way? A sponsor, a firmer, an intercession, a partner, a pastor. Not envious of them because they're getting the attention, not competing with them, but building them up in the name of Jesus. 
There is somebody, if you look around this week, who you can create or strengthen a connection to the body with. Number two, how do you need to stop saying in frustration, the problem is I have no connection, and start seeing the connection God is putting in your path to help you lead you well? Would you pray with me? Lord, we confess that we so quickly, so easily fall into the trap of comparing ourselves with each other, competing with each other for attention, for position. We close ourselves to others because we fear we will expose our weakness and give them an advantage over us. Father, we thank you for the one who came to break that cycle by being broken for us. For the God of the universe, the shepherd who is willing to become one of us, a sheep who said, I did not come to serve but to serve and give my life as a ransom for, ransom for all who will humble themselves. And today as we physically and tangibly once again receive those elements that represent your body, all of yourself given to us, your blood, all of your life given for us to be our true shepherd. Father, grant us your grace to receive this with integrity, recognizing that you are the only sponsor that can bring us home, to receive it and then release it by releasing ourselves to others to serve and love and build each other up in love in the name of Jesus, in whose presence we come before you, all of God's people said, amen. So would you take those elements, those communion elements, and, and just <laughs> unwrap the gift of Jesus right now. Let's all do it together. If you can recognize today and say, that Jesus is the God who became flesh to bring me home to God, that apart from this gift, this work of Jesus, for me, I would be nowhere. If you can say, I want to receive it and live in it and live for it with all my heart, Jesus invites you to declare that openly. Even if you've never done this before, if, if you wanted to say, yes, okay, I get it, I'm in, and I want to, Take that step. Jesus invites you to take it, to declare that. This bread, says Jesus, is my body broken for you. Receive it. This cup, said Jesus, is my blood shed for you instead of you so that you can live in the freedom of forgiveness and openness before God and me taken from Jesus. Now be the God of peace who by the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, our Lord Jesus Christ, equip you with every good thing to do his will, working in us what is pleasing before him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and just spend some time reflecting on the shepherd, reflecting on ways that we can be shepherds to someone, reflecting on ways that we can stop making it all about ourselves and live for the glory of the one who is all.
Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you were pointed to a bigger picture and perhaps reconnected in some way to the solid foundation on which you can build this week. If you have any questions or would like to connect or reconnect in deeper way with God or with the church, or would like someone to pray with you, please email us through our church website. We'd love to touch base. If you enjoyed our service, feel free to give this video a like, share it with your friends, and subscribe to stay up to date with our video resources here on YouTube. As we wrap up, some slides are going to roll with upcoming events and connecting opportunities. Feel free to hang out in the live chat. Share your thoughts on what you heard today. We hope to see you again next week. God bless you. But now